Assalamu alaikum. This is a presentation for medical students by Dr. Mumtaz Ahmed Umar and today's topic is tonsillectomy. Tonsillectomy is the surgical removal of the tonsils. In this picture you will see you have the tonsils they are present and post operatively when the tonsils they are removed uh, that this is the tonsillar fossa which is shown. These are the specimen of the tonsils after the tonsillectomy has been produced. This is its medial surface where these crypts they are present. This is the capsule. So indications, what are the indications? Indications for tonsillectomy they are further subdivided into absolute, relative or as a part of an other surgery. The absolute indications, the first and the foremost is the recurrent infections of throat. It is also known as chronic tonsillitis. It is the most common indications with which the patients they present to us in OPD, but it has to be classified further. I mean, just only recurrent throat infections, it has no value. It needs to be classified. How it is further classified? There should be seven or more episodes of acute tonsillitis. Remember acute attacks of acute tonsillitis, not simple sore throat. Seven or more episodes of acute tonsillitis in one year or five episodes per year for two consecutive years and three episodes per year or for three consecutive years for the last three years, three episodes in last three years. Or along with this, there should be two weeks or more of lost school days or work in a one year. Remaining absolute indications it includes the peritonsillar abscess. Uh, tonsillectomy is usually performed four to six weeks later. Although hot tonsillectomy has been carried out by some surgeons, uh, but it depends upon the surgeons. It's, I mean, it's not necessary that you will do hot tonsillectomy, but uh, peritonsillar abscess uh, can be an absolute indication. Third, if the tonsillitis it is causing febrile seizure. Whenever patients they got acute tonsillitis, they got scissors along with this, then you can perform the tonsillectomy. Then hypertrophy of the tonsils, the tonsillar tissue mass, it is so much enlarged that it causes airway obstruction, especially along with adenoids when it causes the sleep apnea syndrome. Secondly, if it affects the deglutition or interfere with the speech. But in all these cases, history is very important to see that tonsils are the cause for these problems and then if there is suspicion of malignancy how the suspicion arise if the one tonsil is too much enlarged in comparison to the other then the suspicion of uh, malignancy should be kept in mind so the relative uh, indications they include the diphtheria carriers especially those who do not respond to antibiotics as they may be the source for to infect the others then streptococcal carriers again who may become the source of infections for the others than those who have chronic tonsillitis along with halitosis and again history is very important and uh, that the tonsils should be the source of this bad breath how you will see the tonsils are the main cause for the bad breath because when you examine the throat you will find a cheesy material in the tonsillar crypts so usually then uh, it is causing this halitosis then in those in which the recurrent streptococcal tonsillitis uh, in a patient with a valvular heart disease especially I mean those patients who have the valvular heart disease and they have uh, recurrent sore throat then in those patients tonsillectomy should be uh, carried out then tonsillectomy as a part of another operation because we s if you study the anatomy there are many structures in the uh, tonsillar bed also to approach those structures you have to remove the tonsils then tonsillectomy can be as a part of other procedure like in jubilopalatopharyngoplasty or a palatopharyngoplasty it is this procedure is usually done or carried out for sleep apnea syndrome the uvpp in this you remove the soft palate the uvula part of soft palate uvula anterior pillars tonsils posterior pillars and the mucosa from the posterior pharyngeal wall then glossopharyngeal neurectomy tonsil is removed first then the glossopharyngeal nerve is severed in the bed of the tonsil and again the removal of the styloid process i mean these two last two 
uh, again these are present in the tonsil bed so tonsil has to be removed to approach these things these structures contraindication there are certain contraindications but uh, the very important one are if the hemoglobin is less than 10 gram if the patient has acute infection any upper respiratory tract infection at the time of surgery it is a contraindication because there will be a chance of uh, bleeding severe bleeding during the surgery then in children under three years of age previously four to five years uh, tonsillectomy was carried out once the child is five years but now it is considered to be three years then if there is a submucous cleft palate bleeding disorders like leukemia hemophilia von willebrand disease at the time of polio epidemic or patient has any uncontrolled systemic disease like diabetes or hypertension and also it is avoided uh, best avoided during the period of menses anesthesia mainly it is carried out under general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation in adults it can be carried out under local anesthesia uh, but usually i have not seen any case here although one of my friend has underwent tonsillectomy under local anesthesia but in Russia where the temperatures they are very low so in Pakistan local anesthesia is hardly given for tonsillectomy methods of tonsillectomy they are further uh, subdivided into two the cold methods and the hot methods cold methods they include dissection and snare which is the most commonly performed guillotine method it is obsolete now done previously once uh, uh, the tonsillectomy it was started then intracapsular tonsillectomy with debrider it is said that once the capsule is preserved the chances of post-operative pain are very less which is the main feature of to uh, tonsillectomy pain is the main feature of tonsillectomy post-operative pain then harmonics scalpel uh, plasma mediated ablation technique and cryosurgical technique in hot method electrocautery which consists of both the unipolar and bipolar bipolar is now most commonly p done nowadays by many surgeons then laser tonsillectomy or tonsillectomy tonsillotomy coablation tonsillectomy and with radio frequency technique so this is the position for tonsillectomy it is known as the rose position uh, a shoulder roll is placed under the shoulder the neck is extended but hyperextension should be avoided this is the position the surgeon uh, he sits on the head side of the patient the surgeon sits on the head side of the patient the patient is supine neck is extended this instrument is the boyle stevis mouth gag and this is different bipod stands so it makes a self retaining structure and both the hands of surgeon they are free so this is the tonsil, this is tonsil holding forceps and this is the suction and he is using the cautery. So the suction is to suck out the uh, smoke also. This is the tonsil holding forceps and the snare. The snare is used once you reach to the lower pole then you either cut it with a scissor or with a snare. So from the side the surgeon is sitting on the head end of the patient and this is the position of the patient this is the bipolar cautery so as i already mentioned nowadays most of the surgeons they are doing tonsillectomy with bipolar cautery so again this is the picture the broad view and this is the focused one if you visualize this boyle stevis mouth gag there is rubber padding so it will prevent the injury to the teeth Otherwise, if there are no rubber padding, you can put the gauze piece here to prevent injury to the teeth. This is the endotracheal tube. This is the tongue depressor. These are the tonsils. So this is the picture from the front. So we are better able to understand it, uh, the technique, how we will perform it. So uh, when we have the good exposure, we hold the tongue. So let us first see the anatomy in this thing. This is the tonsil with prominent crypts. This is the uvula. This is the soft palate. This is the anterior pillar. And this is the tongue. Hold this one is tongue. This is tongue depressor with endotracheal tube. There is cleft in the tongue depressor to press the tube but not compress it. 
okay usually we give incision along the upper pore because here there is loose connective tissue loose areolar tissue so we pull the tonsil medially give incision here and get to the plane like in this picture we hold the tonsil push the tonsil medially and give incision by either with the blade in the upper pole till the middle or with the bipolar cautery okay we have to reach to the plane that if that when the dissection is done in the plane there will be very minimal bleeding but once you enter the tonsillar tissue or deep to the muscles then the bleeding it will start so after the tonsil is removed a gauze this is a gauze piece gauze is put inside and pressurized okay and then small uh, slowly it is removed to check for any bleeding spot if any bleeding area is visualized we will cauterize that so this way bleeding area is uh, we visualize it and we cauterize this one then the suction is done from the oropharynx and the nasopharynx because the as the neck and head is extended so the blood it will flow back into the nasopharynx so we have to wash that area as well so this is the final picture after the tonsillectomy so this is the post op picture of a patient who underwent tonsillectomy this is the tonsillar fossa of a patient as first post op day this is the fifth post op day this is seventh post op day and this is the 17th post op day if you see in the fifth post or first post op day there will be edema of the uvula and the pillars with formation of the fibrin clot this fibrin clot it increase in quantity and completely fills up the tonsillar fossa till fifth to sixth post op day this fibrin clot it consist of fibrin inflammatory cells and bacteria up till the seventh post op day the fibrin clot it's left off leaving a visible Uh, leaving the visible healing mucosa on the posterior tonsillar pillar and exposed granulation tissue in the tonsillar fossa while complete mucosalization of the tonsillar fossa occurred till the 15 to 17th post op day post operative care immediate general care the patient should be kept in a recovery position which is a left lateral position until the patient is fully recovered he or she is fully recovered from the anesthesia keep watch on the bleeding from the nose and mouth and keep a regular check on vital signs including the blood pressure pulse or heart rate respiratory rate and temperature so after uh, the npo is break it should be broken with the soft and cold diet especially with ice cream custard juice etc on the first post of day patient is advised to chew the bubble gum so the movement will help relieve the pain and hot fluids sour and spicy food should be avoided take special care of the oral hygiene with regular salt and water gargles or with any medicated gargles analgesic especially the albuprofen or paracetamol <coughs> has been pres uh, should be prescribed and antibiotics the penicillin group is effective it should be prescribed complications they may be immediate or delayed immediate complications the most important one are the hemorrhages which is primary hemorrhage that occur at the time of operation or the reactionary hemorrhage which occur within the first 24 hours this again separate uh, presentation uh, of for these post op hemorrhages at as tonsillectomy hemorrhage or post tonsillectomy bleed is very important is surgical emergency and everyone should know how to manage that then if one is not careful during the surgery there can be injury to the tonsillar pillars uvula soft palate tongue or superior constrictor muscle then teeth they get injured aspiration of blood can be occur but how this as blood aspiration how this aspiration of blood be prevented the first thing when you are using the endotracheal tube it should be cuffed endotracheal tube 
it gives protection then to double the protection we put the throat pack inside before doing the surgery okay then facial edema can occur and surgical emphysema can occur late complication it includes secondary hemorrhage which occur usually at 5th to 10th post op day more commonly but can occur as early as second to third day and as late as 13 14th post op day the main cause is sepsis which leads to premature separation of the membrane then infection can occur lung complications can occur there may be scarring in the soft palate and the pillars tonsillar remnants can remain there which later on becomes infected and gets enlarged and because now the tonsil they are removed so lingual tonsil can later on in the life may become hypertrophied and uh, cause problem thank you